Well, hi, my name is Daniel Ogle. I'm the campus pastor here at Westside Table, and we're so glad that you've chosen to join us for worship today. Today, we're going to conclude our three-week series on faith and politics as we consider the kind of life that God invites us to, to be part of, the way that Jesus helps us find the kind of life that we long for. We're so glad that you're here. We hope that you'll take some time and visit our website at westsidetable.com worship. There you can sign in, let us know that you're here, which is so helpful to us. You can share a prayer request and learn more about our mission and vision here at Westside Table. Once again, thanks so much for joining us for worship today. Death is 
There are a lot of things pulling our allegiance these days. But we know as believers, if we're trying to, to pursue the life of Christ and, and let that be um, the way that we build our life, those other things are not as satisfying. It's our prayer and our reminder during this worship time that we want to live for Jesus, that we want to build our life on the foundation of love that, that Christ has given us. We want to put our trust in God because then we will not ever be shaken. Jesus, we live for you. Temptation comes my way
The scripture reading today comes from Matthew 13:44 to Matthew 13:45. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for a choice pearl. I want to begin today with a question from the book of Joshua. It's a book in the Old Testament, early in the Bible, and there comes a point where Joshua has gathered the people, and he's gathered the people to remind them about who God is. He's gathered the people to give thanks to God for bringing them to this moment. And then after he's reminded them of what God has done for them, after he's reminded them that God is with them in this very moment, he asked them a question. He said, who will you serve? Who are you going to follow? Who are you going to offer your allegiance to? Who is going to shape the direction of your life? Choose today, choose this day, who you will serve. And I think as we find ourselves in this moment that that is really an apt question for us. But that question of who we will serve, it's not just a one-time question. It's a question that we get to ask and we have to answer each and every day. That in every decision, we get to decide who we will serve. In every moment, we get to decide who we'll be about. Each and every day, we get to answer that question, who will guide our life? What values, what principles will shape who we are? Who will you serve today? As we find ourselves in wrapping up this series on faith and politics, as we kind of get in the home stretch here of this election here in Georgia, where we've been voting for a while, some of you have been going to polling places across our state and that you've been kind of casting your ballot in the last couple of weeks. Some of you have mailed in your ballot and some of you will cast your vote on Tuesday. You just like to vote on election day. And so you're going to plan on doing that. But we know that question of who will you serve seems particularly relevant. Because I want to tell you something that isn't surprising to you at all. The truth is that our political convictions, the way we think about politics in this moment, that that is often the most inflexible part of our lives, that we tend not to change those convictions too much, that once we vote a certain way, we tend to keep voting that way no matter what. So if you were raised Republican, or maybe you have been voting Republican for a while, you tend to continue to vote that way. And that if you're Democrat, if you were raised to vote Democrat, if you become convinced that the Democratic Party is the way to go, that you tend to vote in that way. That those deeply held positions, those deeply held convictions that get expressed in our two-party system don't really tend to change that much. And there's nothing wrong with having deeply held convictions, right? That there's nothing wrong with having ideas and principles and policies that you really care about. There's nothing wrong about that at all. As a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, I really try to root my life and my faith and my engagement with politics around those lines from the Lord's Prayer, where where when Jesus teaches us to pray, he teaches us to pray this way. He says that your kingdom come, that your will be done, that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so there's nothing wrong with having deeply held convictions, deeply held principles about who we are and about what we think is right and about what we think is important. But, you know, if you've been coming to church for a while, if if the Bible and Scripture is part of your vocabulary, you've probably heard the word idolatry, that there's something about an idol. And we tend to think about idols as, as something that are so large and so big in our life. But what's more often the case is that idols are when something good replaces something that should be ultimate, that when we trade our devotion to God and we give that devotion and we give that allegiance to something else. And I think as we look at this moment we find ourselves in, if we look at the political moment and season we find ourselves, we know that one of our great temptations is to make politics and particularly our allegiance to one party or the other an idol in our life. And so that's why it's really important to turn to the scriptures again. And I love this passage that Hannah read for us from the Gospel of Matthew. It's a short passage, just two or three verses, but it contains two stories. But it really gets back to that question of choose today what you're going to be about. 
Choose today who you're going to serve. Choose today what values and what principles and who gets your allegiance because it's an important choice. It may be the most important choice that you ever make. And so Jesus is talking in the Gospel of Matthew, kind of midway through the Gospel, and he's teaching his disciples, and he tells two stories back to back. And they've got some differences, but really they're, they're, they're kind of making the same point in two different ways. He says, there was a guy who stumbled, and he discovered that there was a field. And in the field, there was a treasure that was worth more than he could imagine. And so, and so the man, having discovered that treasure, he hid the treasure in the field, and then he sold everything he had so he could go buy that field, and so that treasure would be his. And in the other, there was a businessman, a merchant, who was trading in pearls, and he discovered there was a pearl that was worth so much more than he could fathom. And so he sold all he had so he could buy that pearl, and he could trade on that pearl and make more money and build his wealth and build his income because he had found something that was worth more than anything else. And Jesus tells those stories to his disciples and he wants us to hear those as well because he wants us to understand is that the kingdom of God is that treasure. The kingdom of God is that pearl, that life with Jesus, life being faithful to God, life declaring our obedience and allegiance to God, that's what's worth everything. That's what's worth more than we can ask or imagine that it's that it's not any of the other things that we get tempted by. It's not any of the other things that would claim our allegiance. But what Jesus said is what I'm offering you is worth more than you could imagine. What I'm is offering you is better than anything else that you can come up with. That maybe you're going through life and you feel like you haven't quite found what you're looking for just yet. That maybe you're going through life and you're in a hard season. Maybe there are things about yourself that you wish you could fix that you know you you can't. Maybe there are things in your life, relationships that are broken that you wish you could fix, but you weren't able to. And Jesus says, there's a better way. Jesus says, what would it be like if you came to believe that no matter what, that you were valuable? What would it be like to know that no matter what mistake you've made, that forgiveness was possible and you could always move forward? What would it be like knowing that there's an invitation not just to watch God do something, but to be part of what God is doing, that your life is wrapped up in the mission of God and the world to heal the broken world, to heal creation, to build something beautiful and incredible and lasting, that that was what your life was about. Could you believe that? Could you receive that? Jesus would say, not only is that an idea, that is what I'm offering you. That's what's on offer in the gospel. And that's worth everything. That's worth giving everything else up because the reward is so great. It's not a trick. It's not a bait and switch. Jesus says the promise is real and you can count on it. So why don't you come receive it and take it right now? You can forget all the other stuff people tell you. You can forget all the other promises that haven't turned out to be true. Jesus says, I'm giving you the word of God and you can trust and you can count on and you can believe and depend on these promises. And so that is worth everything. That's what Jesus is offering. That's the invitation for you and for me right now. Wouldn't that be worth grasping? Wouldn't that be worth risking? Wouldn't that be worth knowing that people think that, that you might have lost your mind? Wouldn't that be worth taking that risk if you knew that was true? Over the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about this vision in the gospel that really flows from the great commandment to love God with everything we have, and to love our neighbor as ourself. And what the New, New Testament is convinced of, what the New Testament is trying to convince us of, is that that is the path to the good life. That is the invitation that God gives us. That is what we can receive, and that is what is on offer, and that's what a good life looks like. Not a life that's all about ourselves and our own interests, not a life that even is about our politics and our political parties' preferred outcomes, that it's not about kind of a long-sustaining majority, but it's about a way of life with God. You know, sometimes I know that sounds crazy when you look out at the world that we live in, that the world that kind of feels like it's on fire each and every day, sometimes to love your neighbor, the command that saying, love your neighbor, that that would make a difference. That just feels like you're just putting your head in the sand. I know how that sounds. And when we look out in a world that cries for big structural change and to say that 
to love our neighbor as ourselves, to try to make our neighborhood a little different, to try to offer kindness and compassion and mercy and love and justice in the small ways that most of us have influence. That feels like that doesn't go very far. And I, I know sometimes you may even be listening to this right now. You might be skeptical of what I'm saying. And I totally hear that. I totally hear what you're saying. But I want you to know that when you read the scripture, when we read the Bible, if we, as we believe that's true, as we come to read those stories and they become our story, what we realize is that the Bible is filled with stories of God taking small, seemingly insignificant things and magnifying them and enlarging them and doing incredible things with them. One of the most well-known stories in all of the Bible is Jesus feeding 5,000 men and, and then add on women and children to that with just a few loaves and some fishes, that God has the power to magnify what you do and the gifts that you offer to make a real difference in the world, even if it seems crazy, even if it doesn't seem practical, even if it doesn't seem to make sense. That's the promise of the gospel. That's the offer. That's what we believe, that God can do incredible things and can maximize even things that feel small and insignificant to us. You know, my friend Heather, she was invested in politics early in her life and kind of continued to be interested in politics. And in 2016, like a lot of folks, she was heartbroken about the presidential election. She was so upset. She kind of stared at her television and didn't understand what was going on. She couldn't fathom how, why it had gone the way that it had gone. And so, like so many, she kind of stayed up late and she was trying to figure out what it would mean for her. She was trying to figure out how she could respond would she sulk in disappointment or could she see another way? And so what Heather did is she did something that maybe wouldn't seem significant to a lot of people, but she made a decision. She said, I'm going to get more involved in my neighborhood. I'm going to come to understand who my neighbors are. I'm going to come to understand the local issues that make a difference. And so over time, what happened is, and this is what happens in neighborhoods, is that when you express any interest, they give you a leadership position real fast. So before long, Heather found herself in a leadership position, having real power and agency and ability to kind of move things in her neighborhood or neighborhood association. And what happened is she became to understand and came to learn more about what was going on in her, the lives of her friends and neighbors and her streets. She began to understand some of the big structural issues that happened down at City Hall and how those affected people that she cared about. She got to get on a first name basis with city councilmen and, and commissioners and she came to understand and know who the players were and how things could change. And four years later, her life is different because that, uh, that decision she made. Four years later, she has relationships and friendships that she didn't have before. Four years later, she's making a real impact and what's happening not only in her neighborhood, but across Atlanta. Because she decided to get involved. She decided to understand that making relationships with people who lived near her and understanding the business community and understanding the, the justice issues in her neighborhood could help her make a big difference. She, she came to understand that loving her neighbor could change her life. So I hope that if you haven't already voted, that by Tuesday you will go vote. I hope that you'll do that, but I hope that you'll do something else. I want to ask you a question as we conclude. What's your life going to look like after Election Day? What difference is your life going to make after you cast your vote? Are there ways that you can get involved? Are there ways that you can love your neighbor? What would it be like to give it a month? And to see what would happen if you intentionally chose to do things that would lead to the love of your neighbor. What would it be like if you chose to, to kind of know the names of the people who live around you? What would it mean if you decided to do something small, maybe that didn't seem significant, and just see what God might do with it? Because the treasure and the pearl are Jesus' way of saying is that there is a better life available for us. And as crazy as it sounds, as insignificant as it might seem, that it really does begin with loving our neighbor. That as we love our neighbor, we learn to love God. As we learn to love God, we learn to love our neighbor. And as we do those things, our vision expands. We get to see a different kind of life. We get to imagine a life that's bigger than what we thought was possible. We begin 
to understand and make relationships and connect with people in our life begins to take on more of a character, a more distinct character, a more Christian character, that we get to play our part in what God is doing in the world, that that's the invitation for us. That's the call of the gospel on our lives, and that is what is on offer for us. And I want to leave you with this challenge. Give it a month and see what God might do in your life, see what God might do in your neighborhood through you, and see what God might do in this city through you and your neighbors. Don't be a jerk. Love your neighbor. Get involved. Choose that which will lead to life and see what happens for you and your family and your neighborhood and the city and the kingdom that God is building. Amen. And now in this time of the service, I invite you to lift up any prayer requests or praises in the comments below, or feel free to send us a private message. We would love to continue praying for you. And now let us pray. Loving God, you are our home comfort and provider. Since the beginning of creation, you have made us your people and made a way for us in the wilderness. You are our ultimate guidance and most capable leader, especially in times of uncertainty. On this day, the Sunday before election day, we come before you with anticipation. Remind us of your sovereignty and that no matter what comes our way, you will always provide us a way back to you. God, as the people go to this polls this week, we pray first and foremost for peace. May the sense of community and connection be greater than any division or difference, no matter how ingrained. Knowing we will vote in schools, churches, synagogues, and other communal gathering places, may our commitment to care for one another grow as we stand in lines, talk to our neighbors, and recognize that we have more in common than we often realize. May we show one another kindness and respect, not just on election day, but also in the days to come. God, we also thank you for the freedom to vote our conscience. After this election, we are aware that even if the political rhetoric fades, the hostility it's highlighted will remain for some time. God, grant us the courage to step into the gaps and not retreat back into our own like-minded tribes. Send us your spirit to drive us to the places where you are already working to bring reconciliation and remind us relentlessly that you are greater than every category we devise, more powerful than any schism we've created, and always calling forth justice, peace, and abundant life. God, show us today and every day how to live in the love of Jesus Christ, the perfect love that casts out all fear. We pray all these things in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. And now we come to the time in this morning's worship service where we invite you to give. Giving is a way to worship God, it's a way to honor God, and it's a way to partner with what God is doing in the city of Atlanta. If you want to support the mission of Westside Table, of building a bigger table, then I invite you to head on over to our website at westsidetable.com donate. Any gift given will help us grow our own community as well as partner with those doing good in Atlanta. Thank you so much.
Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us for worship today as we concluded our series on faith and politics that we called Thou Shall Not Be a Jerk. But I hope that you'll receive this invitation as you go. I hope that you'll receive the invitation that God wants you to be part of what God is doing in the world, that your life counts, that your life matters, that you can make a difference. And it doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be huge. It starts with loving your neighbor and loving your neighborhood. And God can do great things through things that seem small and insignificant. So I hope you'll go and I hope you'll receive these words. Don't be a jerk. Love your neighbor. Receive the life you want and receive the life that you were made for. Take care.